Thank you, Biff, very much uh, for reading. Let me uh, add my welcome to Mickey's. My name is Tim. I lead the student team here, and it's wonderful uh, that you've been able to join us this evening. Please keep Galatians 2 open, and you might find it helpful to turn to the inside of the first sheet you were given. Uh, when you arrive by the door, there is a handout in there uh, that may help you. In every important cause, there comes a moment of crisis, a decision, a turning point, a watershed moment when that cause will either persist or collapse. In 1940, the UK faced a crisis over whether or not it would declare war on Germany. The Nazi army had advanced across France and was rapidly approaching the British Channel, and the pain of the Great War at the First World War, was still live in the memory of many Britons. They wanted to do everything they could to avoid facing another war. They could have negotiated a peace settlement, effectively resigned, raised the white flag, capitulated to the imposing forces of the Nazi army spreading across the continent, or they could declare war, prepare for battle, and take on the army. It was a moment in history given uh, fresh attention a couple of years ago with the Oscar-winning film The Darkest Hour. The film probably overstated how much Winston Churchill was alone in pursuing his cause, but it gave a great sense of the gravity of that situation, now, particularly towards the end of the film when he's depicted delivering his now famous speech, We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches. In every important cause, uh, there comes a moment of crisis, a moment of decision, a turning point, when that cause will either persist or collapse. And what we have in our passage this evening is such a moment in the history of Christianity. It appears remarkably unimportant, doesn't it? How can the seating arrangements at an after-church meal have that big a, make that much of a difference? Uh, but in fact, it is an achingly significant moment in the history of Christianity when, as we're about to see, there were pressures to add to the gospel, and so to make it no gospel at all. The very truth of the gospel was at stake. And unlike back in 1940, uh, the, uh, the opposition to the gospel, the, the impetus to try and add to it, is still here today. And not in the same form as back then, not with the same labels, but the same uh, inoffensive forces are allied against the gospel. They're the same subtle pressures to resign, uh, raise the white flag, uh, capitulate, to change the gospel by adding to it. And so to make it no gospel at all. And so whether you're coming to tonight's passage as a Christian or not, can you see that the history of this moment has so much to teach us? Uh, that what might seem like a weird, slightly idiosyncratic disagreement between two guys a couple of millennia ago is actually uh, going to tell us about whether the Christianity we engage with is the cause of Christ or no gospel at all. Now, the passage here is to warn us against subtly abandoning the truth of the gospel. And it starts with something as innocuous as Sunday lunch. Have a look down at chapter 2 and verse 11 on page 1170 if you've lost it. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. A Cephas, also known as Peter in the Bible, he's one of the apostles that is, he's been specifically chosen to uh, by Jesus to take his message out to the world. He was described in last week's passage as a pillar. He's a big name in Christianity. And he's come to visit Paul and the other guys in Antioch. Uh, and he's uh, spending some time up there, a couple of weeks north of Jerusalem, uh, if you were to walk. He's having a great time. He's enjoying Syria's finest cuisine and hanging out with the, the Gentiles there. Uh, you can imagine him, if he was here, heading over to After Eights with all the rest of us. We've got pulled pork uh, on the menu for tonight. So he's very much heading, heading across there and enjoying uh, all that um, Gentiles are allowed to enjoy. But then he notices 
there's a bunch of guys in from Jerusalem this week. And suddenly, he's spitting out the pork and he's launching himself from his seat and finding his way into the Jews only corner. And we don't have a Jews only corner in St. Andrews, you'll be relieved to hear. But imagine that we did. Uh, Peter is running over there to try and avoid looking like he's too chummy with the Gentiles. And we don't know everything that's going on in his head. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see that Paul is quite, uh, Peter is quite clear on these things by this point. But we get a clue about his thinking in verse 12. Uh, he was fearing the circumcision party. Uh, which sounds like the worst party in the world, doesn't it? A <laughs> circumcision party. Um, they were a group. They were a group who were big on male circumcision. They were big on the Old Testament law. And they were claiming that in order to be saved, you need to keep the law of Moses. Keep a finger in Galatians. And just flip back to page 1113, 1113. And hopefully you'll find yourself in Acts 15, which gives us Luke's account of this very moment in history or something very close to it. Acts 15. Um, And just those first couple of verses we're going to read, and they help us to place uh, the book of Galatians. Let me read Acts 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. And we're not told about Peter's engagement with this uh, discussion, but it seems to be around the same time. Uh, there's a group who've come down the hill from Judea uh, to Antioch in Syria, and they were teaching the Gentiles that you have to get circumcised if you want to be part of God's people. Uh, Luke says there's no small dissension. That's basically his way of saying they had a huge argument. And so Paul felt that he needed to go down to Jerusalem to sort it out. And I take it this letter of Galatians was penned during verse 2. While Paul is on his way down to Jerusalem, before the debate that we get recorded in the rest of Acts 15. And that's why the great decision in that chapter, Acts 15, isn't even mentioned in Galatians, in the book of Galatians. Paul is writing this letter on the way to Jerusalem with that argument in Antioch still knocking around his head, unsure of exactly what kind of decision will be settled upon. And so flip back to Galatians 2 and imagine how Paul is feeling as he's writing these words. He has been laboring away, delighting in this gospel that is for all nations. Last week, we heard of his great relief when he got to Jerusalem and heard that he and the apostles were all on the same page, that he hadn't been laboring in vain. Everything was fine. They agreed with him then. But now, back home in Antioch, there's this teaching that's emerged that Paul sees as a denial of the gospel. And one of the apostles, even, has behaved in a way that seems to confirm it. At worse than that, he seems to lead others to do the same. Look at verse 13. The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. At Galatians 2.13 shows us that Peter had carried other people along with him, it seems. Even Paul's partner in ministry, Barnabas, joining in that Jews-only corner are supporting this terrible behavior, giving the impression that Gentiles need to go back to the law. And worst of all, Peter seems to have been prompted by the arrival of certain men from James. So it's not just Peter, but even James, the apostle, might be involved as well. What's going on in in Mother Church back there in Jerusalem? Have the apostles abandoned the gospel? Suddenly, this message that's designed to save the world is being neutered by a false teaching that introduces limitations on the gospel, that limits the boundaries of God's grace so that it only extends as far as those who've become Jews. Now, Paul has labored in service of the nations for years by this point, but now it seems like the church leaders in Jerusalem have lifted the barriers and abandoned the message with which they started. And so Paul, heading down to Jerusalem, Uh, writing this letter, sees that the very cause of the gospel 
is at stake. Can you see why Paul began this letter warning that if anyone, even himself, even an angel, said a different gospel, then he should be accursed? Because he sees it as a real possibility. And whatever the outcome when he gets to Jerusalem, whatever the apostles might conclude, Paul wants the Galatians to stick to the essential, original message of Jesus. Whatever the outcome in Jerusalem, the cause of the gospel stands or falls on whether or not they stay true to it. Now, if you read Acts, uh, please read Acts 15 later, you'll see that the apostles were actually all on the same side as Paul. Uh, He needn't have worried in that sense. And we don't need to worry that the apostles got it wrong. They didn't. They were right. But while Paul was writing Galatians, he didn't know that. The last time he'd seen Peter, Peter had behaved in a way that seemed to uh, contradictory to the gospel. He was, as Paul puts it in verse 14, not in step with the truth of the gospel. But I guess some of us are thinking, why? I mean, why does it matter that much? Isn't it a bit of an overreaction, Paul? He seems to think it's a denial of the gospel, but that feels a bit strong, doesn't it? He's just eating in a different place. Why does Peter's behavior matter so much? And if you're using the handout, you'll see there's a couple of answers to that question, but I've mistyped the first one. So if you've got a pen there, you'll find it useful to change that first one into the futility of relying on the law. It cannot justify. The futility of relying on the law, it cannot justify. Let me read again uh, from verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, No one will be justified. It's possible that Paul is still talking to Peter at this point. It's hard to tell where the quote in verse 14 ends. But what is clear is Paul's point, isn't it? He says we're Jews, uh, not Gentiles, and yet even we as Jews aren't relying on the law. Now before those guys came up from Jerusalem, before Peter knew they were there, he was merrily eating his pulled pork uh, buns with the rest of the guys over in After Eights. And he knew just as well as Paul that he didn't need to keep the law because the law can't put you in the right with God. Our natural position is guilty before God. That's true of all of us. I'm not sure if you realize when we had the confession at the beginning of our meeting together, that's what we're saying. We've lived in rebellion against God. Every one of us deserves his judgment. But the great truth of the Christian message is that we are put in the right with God, justified through trusting in Jesus. God's final verdict on us, the verdict that we will get on judgment day, is announced for us in the present for every one of us who's trusting in Jesus. You are right with him, justified. And obedience to the law cannot bring about that verdict. It cannot justify. Indeed, Paul is so convinced of this. He says it three times in one verse. Did you spot that? Verse 16, uh, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, number one, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we've believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, number two. Because just in case you've not got it yet, by works of the law, no one will be justified. Uh, Peter says it so many times. You're starting to think, He's become one of those politicians. You know, in the last general election, every time Mrs. May was in front of the camera, you get strong and stable at some point, probably more than once. Uh, Well, Paul has adopted that kind of repetitive tactic in order to get across this very simple truth. The law of Moses cannot put you in the right with God. And Peter knew that as well, didn't he? Peter. That was why he, like Paul, was trusting in Jesus and not trusting obedience to the law. So any behavior that implies people do need to rely on the law is ludicrous. Now, the law contributes nothing to my standing before God. How could it? Relying on the law is futile because a right standing before God, now and forever, is only determined by trusting in Jesus. I am forever right with God, justified by faith in Jesus. And I need to reiterate this point. 
is still present today. I was chatting to a visitor after our sermon last week when Mickey had been unequivocally clear that we are saved only by radical grace, uh, by God's undeserved kindness to us, nothing to do with what we do. And the person I was chatting to said, yeah, I agree with everything that was said. I think God just wants us to be loving. And if we are loving enough, then he'll accept us. No, that's not right. That is precisely wrong. That is not what Paul is saying here. We cannot love enough to get in the right with God. We are accepted only through faith in Jesus. And so the law of Moses, a law which will later be summarized in this book as love your neighbor as yourself, it cannot justify me. As some of you will know that I've got a health problem, which means basically my immune system wants to attack my gut. Uh, you don't want to know the details of it, uh, but the long and short of it is that I have to take some medication to try and dampen down my immune system. It's probably why I've got a cold at the moment. Uh, the problem is this medication doesn't actually cure the problem. It's basically just a reminder twice a day that I've got a problem that hasn't been fixed. Uh, only some pretty uh, radical surgery would actually solve the problem and provide any kind of cure. Now, there's various limitations of this illustration, uh, but can you see how that hangs on to our problem with being, uh, being in the wrong with God and needing, needing a solution to fix that? The law is like this medication. Uh, can you see that it doesn't fix the problem? It's simply a daily reminder that we've got a problem that isn't fixed. No one is going to be right with God. Have that problem cured through the law. We are justified only by faith in Jesus. And chances are everyone would be happy up until this point. Uh, they'd agree with what Paul is saying. But at this point, uh, Paul takes it a step further. It's not just that relying on the law is futile in the first place. More than that, Paul says returning to the law undermines what Jesus has accomplished in the gospel. It's point two on the handout, if you're still following there. The catastrophe of returning to the law, it undermines the gospel. Let me read from these verses again, verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Seems like Paul is facing some kind of accusation uh, from this circumcision group. You can almost hear them. He says, uh, they're saying to him something like, if you behave like all of these uh, pagan Gentile sinners, Paul, then you end up undermining the gospel. A Christ ends up promoting all of this wrong Gentile behavior. Uh, the Christ in your Christianity, they say, is a servant of sin. Because if you're thinking of Gentiles as these kind of pagan idolaters, that everything they do is basically just sinful, if that's your conception of the nations, then any gospel that enables you to behave like them serves sin. And Paul would therefore seem to have undermined the whole gospel. If you've not followed that question, then don't worry, because Paul basically just says, certainly not. That is not the case. In fact, he turns it all around. He says, on the contrary, it's when you return to the law that the gospel is undermined. And he proves this by showing what's happened in the gospel. And there is loads packed into these verses. I realize that some of us have been off on weekends away, and so we're starting to drift off. Please, give yourself a shake or get your neighbor to elbow you in the ribs, because uh, these are incredible verses with huge amount in them, and it will be worth us really feasting on the gold. That's the wrong kind of mix of metaphors, isn't it? Feasting on the riches that are uh, in these verses. Uh, Paul says something so astonishing here. I'm just going to say it. Uh, you might gasp. Uh, but let me show you that's what he's saying. Paul says that in his gospel, in the gospel of Jesus, his relationship with the law has ended. Look at verse 19 with me, would you? For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. Christ. 
Uh, Paul is saying that his relationship with the law of Moses came to a dramatic close when Jesus died. Because when Jesus died, Paul died with him. It's a teaching that theologians call union with Christ, and it's taught throughout the New Testament. And maybe you've noticed that instead of the Bible using the language of Christians, it more commonly talks to those who are in Christ. And that's because Christians are those who have been united to Christ, hidden in him. And so what has happened to Jesus has happened to us. Uh, Imagine a slightly trite illustration, if you can forgive it, uh, that when I put this bookmark into this book, then wherever the book goes, the bookmark goes, right? And so if the book comes down here, the bookmark is down there, right? If the book comes up here, where's the bookmark? It's up there. It's quite straightforward. Well, in a slightly similar way, (laughs) when Paul put his trust in Jesus, he was united to Jesus. And what happened to Jesus happened to Paul. So when Jesus went to the cross, Paul went to the cross in him. When Jesus died, Paul died in him. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. But Paul says that because he died with Jesus, he died to everything that belongs to his old life. He died to everything uh, back then. Chapter uh, 1 verse 4 told us that Jesus died to deliver us from this present evil age. He's saying that Christians die to this age and everything in it. But shockingly, the list of the things that Paul died to includes the law. Verse 19, I died to the law. Through Christ's death on the cross, Paul died with him and was radically disconnected from this whole age, including the law. And not that the law is evil, On the contrary, the law is a good thing. Paul is very clear on that. In fact, verse 19 19 tells us that it was through the law that this whole salvation plan got accomplished. But the law, as we'll see in chapter 13, has a sell-by date. It was given just for a time. Now, to put it most strongly, though it was given by God, it belongs to the present age, to this world. And so now that Jesus has come, Now that this way of salvation has been made even more clear, and now that we have been delivered from this present evil age, now that Paul has been united to Jesus in his death, he has died to the law. He's been set free from it. Paul has undergone a fundamental break in his relationship with the law. You can see exactly the same thing in Romans 7. Check it out later. Although as the language of verse 18 puts it, he has effectively torn down the law. So why would he build it up again? If that's what Jesus has done in the gospel, why would Paul build it up again? And more importantly, as Gentiles who have never needed to be under the law, why would we go seeking it out? A Paul, like every Christian, now lives a new life, united to Christ, trusting in him, a part of God's new creation breaking into this world. And his whole approach to pleasing God is not based on the old way, on observing the law of Moses. But, verse 20, by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We'll see much more of that in chapter 5. But this radical change has occurred. Why would we try and reinstate the law? Now picture me with my medication again. Uh, But imagine that I have this radical surgery. I've got this cure. That's brilliant news, isn't it? It's all sorted. And then imagine I go back to taking this medication again. That would be really absurd, wouldn't it? And my whole relationship with these tablets has ended. Now that I've got a cure, I'm not going to go back to them, am I? It's not just that this medication is futile. It's that taking this medication denies that the surgery fixed the problem. It's suggesting that I need to add to the work of the surgeon. Well, in a similar way, to return to the law is to deny what Christ has done. That's why verse 21 concludes, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Or as footnote 3 puts it, if righteousness were through the law, 
Then Christ died for no purpose. Christ died to justify us and to deliver us from the present evil age. If I've rightly understood the cross, then my whole approach to the law is going to be radically different, as we'll see later in this book. But particularly, if I go back to the law to be justified, to be right with God, if I think my relationship with God depends on my obedience to the Old Testament law, then I've really got it wrong. I'm fundamentally denying the work of Christ at the cross, at the heart of the gospel. Returning to the law to be right with God is a catastrophe because it fundamentally undermines the gospel. Uh, Please don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here. He is not saying that we need to bin the Old Testament. Certainly not. Uh, The Old Testament is still scripture that has been written for our good. It's still profitable for us. Keep reading it and finding treasure there. Uh, The law of Moses reveals to us the character of God. Ultimately, it shows us his unfolding plan of salvation, as lots of us will have discovered in uh, Bible studies that we've had there. But we're going to see that our approach to the law is radically different because of Christ's death. Uh, Keep coming back and read ahead uh, into chapter 3. Christ did not die so that you and I would go back to the law. Nor is Paul saying that we can now just live lives of flagrant sin instead. Certainly not. Christ has liberated us to live by faith in the Son of God. And we're going to see at the end of this book that Christians are engaged in a constant battle with sin to put it to death. And no, this isn't an excuse to sin. Nor is Paul saying that everyone with a different view on the law is necessarily a heretic. Certainly not. Uh, Read the book of Romans and Colossians, and you'll see there's nuance in the way that Paul talks about these things, because it depends exactly on what someone is claiming. But if I spend the last few minutes of this talk uh, simply introducing caveats from the rest of Scripture, first of all, it'll be really boring. There'll be even more yawns than we've already got. But worst of all, we're going to lose the real force of these verses entirely. Do you remember the crisis which prompted this letter? Do you remember what was going through Paul's head? What was at stake? Paul wrote this letter at a watershed moment in the history of the church. This was Paul's great, we we shall fight them on the beaches kind of moment. It was possible that the whole church was about to abandon God's saving message just a few years in. They were adding obedience to the law to justification by faith, saying that you needed both. And so they were fundamentally denying that Jesus' death had worked, denying the cross of Christ from which all of God's blessings flow. You might be familiar with the idea of gospel maths. You heard that phrase before? Uh, The idea that to add to Jesus' message destroys it. A Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It's the whole gospel. You don't need to add anything to what Jesus has done. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. If you add to the gospel, you destroy it. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. That's gospel maths. And gospel maths is even true with the Old Testament law. Indeed, it is especially true with it with the holy, good, God-given law of Moses. If you make relationship with God dependent on faith plus obedience to the law, then you deny the cross. You cause the gospel to collapse. If you insist that Christians get circumcised or keep the Sabbath or tithe, you must do this in accordance with the custom of Moses. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. If you want to keep Sunday special or give 10%, then go ahead. As I've said already, as as we'll see later in the series, I don't think you need to. But if you want to, then you can. And that's allowed. But if you make it necessary, if you say you must, if you start suggesting that my relationship with God depends on my obedience to the law of Moses... Well, now you're taking me back to this present age. And you're insisting that relationship with God depends on the law. But verse 21 says, if righteousness were through the law, 
then Christ died for no purpose. You're undermining the gospel. Uh, Paul is concerned here for our use of the Old Testament law. But it's worth saying, just as we start to draw to a close, this passage, it applies to, um, in a secondary way to other works that people might insist we add to trusting in Jesus. Uh, whenever anyone adds to Jesus, they end up denying the cross. Uh, J.C. Ryle, the 19th century bishop, saw this in his generation. He saw that the Catholic teaching on the Mass, which is still alive and well today, added to the work of Christ. Uh, the Catholic Church says that Jesus' is once for all sacrifice needs to be repeated in the Mass. And so in one of my favourite books, Five English Reformers, uh, he quotes the 16th century bishop, John Hooper. If you've lost who's quoting who, don't worry, just listen to this. Helps if I'm on the right page. Uh, here's what it says. Likewise, I believe and confess that the Popish Mass is the invention and ordinance of man, a sacrifice of Antichrist and a forsaking of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is to say of his death and passion and that it is a stinking and infected sepulchre which hideth and covereth the merit of the blood of Christ. As you see, because the Mass says that Jesus once for all death is not enough. It hides and covers what Jesus has accomplished in the gospel. Uh, Ryle wrote this book to resist the uh, calls that were being made to try and reunite the Church of England with the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church was teaching that which denies the gospel. Uh, we have the same battle in our generation. And we have it in numerous forms, and not just with what the Roman Catholic Church teach. During the Student Events Week across London uh, a week ago, a number of talks were visited by individuals from the International Church of Christ, who insist that unless you are baptised in their church, you cannot be saved. Now, can you see how they're adding to the work of Christ? They've added a, a human means to the gospel that we're taught in Scripture. And they'll use various misreadings of scripture to make their point. But they're saying, unless you get baptized in their church, you cannot be saved. Uh, from time to time, members of the ICC uh, will make their way into St. Helens and invite members of the church family here to uh, their Bible studies. And so William, the rector here, has asked me to say, if someone from the International Church of Christ uh, approaches you, please grab one of the senior members of staff and let us know. Their teaching fundamentally denies the gospel. Time prevents me from exploring numerous applications of this passage to our age. But the call to keep in step with the truth of the gospel resounds with a clear note. If everything else has gone over your head this evening, then don't worry. Now, these are just the headlines. We're going to get to explore these over the next few weeks. Now, the next nine weeks, in fact, we'll unpack what we've seen in just a few verses here. But please remember that the issue of the law and adding to the gospel matters. This whole series matters. We're talking about behavior and teaching which deny the cross of Christ. It was crucial at the start of the gospel and it remains true today. It is important for us to get this right. So please read ahead, chew over the verses that are coming, study them before we gather together so that we can make sure that we are those who keep in step with the truth of the gospel. We live a new life by faith in the Son of God, a life of liberty and freedom. And I, for one, am thrilled that we get to spend the next couple of months exploring the vast reaches of that freedom together. Shall I lead us in a prayer as we close? Lord God, we do praise you for the work of Christ that stands at the centre of your gospel. We praise you for so clearly declaring it to us and we ask that we would be those who keep in step with it and keep us trusting solely on his work for our benefit and help us in these coming weeks as we come to explore all that he's accomplished for us to delight in the freedom that you have won for us. In Jesus' name, amen.